All right, everybody, well, welcome. Let's start rolling. Welcome everybody to the 2024 uh, w New York State Water Resources Institute Summer Intern Program Symposium. Uh, just to quickly, just thank you everybody for coming. We'll get into logistics in a minute, but um, I just wanna start off with a really quick overview of what the WRI program, uh, intern program is. So it's a, a 10 week um, program for Cornell students, grad and undergrad. It's a paid internship that we run a little bit like a sort of a fellowship cohort. Um, basically what we're trying to get them to do is to learn about the breadth and complexity of water resources issues in New York state and some of the ways that we might try to address some of those issues and then specifically try to move some of those, uh, those um, projects forward over the summer, which they did and I think you'll all enjoy and seeing what they, what they contributed. So each student works on two projects, um, a primary and a secondary, um, and that is the bulk of their work, but we also have, again, like I said, it's sort of like a fellowship. We run a lot of supplemental activity as well where they're learning skills development, uh, learning about other types of water resources, other water resources issues um, in the state. So this year, we are fortunate to have six students, two grad, four undergrad, that you'll be hearing from today. Um, a little bit on logistics. I guess first off, um, the, the, they'll be presenting on their projects either uh, together or alone. Um, you're welcome to stay on for the entirety of the uh, of the webinar, or you can come and go as you need. We're going to do our best to stay on schedule uh, and start at the you know have all the all the talks start at the right times. Um, for questions, if you're online at any point, just type them into the chat. We have we're monitoring those. Um, but the way we've structured this is that each talk is ten minutes. There'll be five minutes at the end of each talk for questions, and then we have a fifteen minute block of time um, at the end at three o'clock if you if you have more questions. Um, for those in the room, we said light refreshments. We don't have any light refreshments, but anybody who's here or maybe on campus watching, feel free to join us at the dairy bar afterwards for ice cream. I'm happy to buy, buy you an ice cream. Um, so to jump into a little bit before we before we get off the ground, I just want to to give a few thank yous. So starting off, um, I wanna thank our funders. So the, the three main sources of funding are the USGS, they, they are core funding for the, the Water Resources Institute, and um, they have a strong mission in, in education and training. Uh, the DEC, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Great Lakes Watershed Program, and the Hudson River Estuary Program have also um, funded the, our, our students this year. So big, Big thank you for, for to our donors or funders. <laughs> um, another huge thank you to the mentors. So each project has at least one mentor. Um, I think as we go through, everybody will call out who these specific mentors are and, and give thanks to them. But just this, this program wouldn't work without the mentors. So basically um, we have WRI staff here and elsewhere in the state who are mentors. And we also, this year we had one um, Cornell faculty member in BEE who is a um, a mentor, and I, I guess the thanks is to you know sort of hurting these projects along the way, but also thinking about upfront. And I feel like people really spent some time thinking about what was an engaging but relatively bite-sized project that then would also give students some flexibility to address in a way that fit their skills and abilities and interests. So. Um, Again, I hope you agree. I think this year we came up with a really nice suite of seven projects that really did that. Um, we are always looking for more projects. So if you happen to have a project that you have in mind for next year, knock on wood, we'll be doing this program again next year. So please um, reach out to me. Uh, I'm Kristen Hitchka. I don't think I introduced myself. Kristen Hitchka at the Water Resources Institute. And I am, um, we'll, we'll, we can talk and, and figure something out. Um, I guess I'd also like to thank WRI staff broadly. I mean, the, the mentors were a big help, but 
this program is not, uh, it, it really happens because of a lot of effort from all the WRI staff. So the admin staff who, you know, helped make the hiring process possible, and then, um, you know, all the logistics behind that, but also the, all the staff that did things for the supplemental activities, like, you know, got somebody here to talk about presentation skills. And uh, we had somebody who ran the book club. So lots and lots of um, oars in the water to keep this, this boat moving. So thank you very much, sincerely, for all that you did. Um, and I can't, I'd be remiss without specifically calling out the Hudson River Estuary Program Education Team for organizing our trip to the Hudson, which was um, swashbuckling and full of um, <laughs> information and adventure and uh, and and rain. So, uh, but this was, uh, um, I guess that leads into my final set of thanks, which is to these interns themselves, which I think that experience really showed them to be resilient, um, people and you know you really kind of rolled with the punches in a way that was greatly appreciated but generally speaking I think um what was most important is you showed up and maintained sort of a growth mindset throughout the summer and you know you asked good questions you engaged in discussions you gave and received feedback I thought quite well and um in the times when you got stuck you found ways to navigate out of that and, and figure out what to do next. And I admire you all for doing that. And I, I'm very grateful for the work you put in. Um, and I think it shows. And so you'll see in their presentation as they talk about their process and also their um, research and outreach deliverables, um, you'll get a sense of, of who they are and what they, what they contributed to WRI through their work this summer. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm a, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, let's see. Anybody else? Did I forget to thank anybody? Can anybody in the room say? <laughs> Facilities and management, the people. <laughs> 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 Always thankful for them. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, yeah, again, reach out to me. I guess I didn't do, I, I will just briefly say that I am Kristen Hitchka. And um, maybe somebody would be willing to put my email in the chat. Um, but if you do want to reach out to me, um, either I will be coordinating this next year or maybe somebody else will and I can pass your message along. But we're definitely interested in hearing from you um, about potential projects. So please, please do reach out. I run the climate team here centrally in Ithaca. Um, and I, oh, I, yeah, I run the, run the climate team theme and also the riparian management theme. I guess I didn't explicitly thank Brian, who is our fearless leader. He's in the room. Brian Rahm is our director. Um, and he's, this was his baby many, many years ago. He's, he, he got this program off the ground. And so we're moving it forward. Um, and let's see, I had one other thought. Yeah, I think that's it. I think, I think that's what I, all I've got to say. Maybe we'll start. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce the first speakers. It's Sarah Cook and Mar Molly Corley, and they're going to be talking about um, violations of disaffected byproduct regulations in New York State. And I, I will also let you know, hopefully you know, but this is being recorded, just so you are aware that this, um, this webinar is being recorded. So, you know, proceed accordingly, but also know that you, we will post this and you'll be able to see these um, and share these videos in the future. Thank you. Okay, I guess we can just start with introducing ourselves. So hi, I'm Sarah Cook. Um, I am a Cornell student here. I'm an undergraduate rising senior and I'm majoring in environmental engineering in the College of Engineering. And I'm Molly Corley. I'm a second year graduate student in the Masters of Public Administration program focusing on environmental policy. Should we go for it? Let's go for yeah. it. So today we're going to be talking about disinfection byproducts exceedances in New York State over the past 10 years. So chemical disinfectants such as like fluorine are added to the drinking water um, during the treatment process in order to remove harmful pathogens and microbes. Um, but they can also react with organic matter, which is already in the water, producing disinfection byproducts. The Safe Drinking Water Act regulates these disinfection byproducts uh, by setting maximum contaminant levels 
which community water systems have to follow. Community water systems are public water utilities that serve the same population year round. Um, these CWSs are responsible for sampling and reporting regu uh, regulated contaminants such as DVPs. For our project, we looked at CWSs in New York State, excluding New York City because they have different reporting requirements. So the disinfection byproducts include THM4, which is a group of four trihalomethanes, and HA5, which is a group of five haloacetic acids. There's also regulated um, bromate and chlorite, um, but those are ex are outside of the scope of this project. Looking at um, THM4 and HA5s, though, um, these two groups are prevalent in water when they react with organic matter, as Molly said, and um, they form uh, they're due to, um, they form based, different things will form in water based on type and extent of organic matter, as well as like type and extent of um, the disinfection used. So if it's chlorine, that might produce one type of um, disinfection byproduct, where if it was another disinfectant used, it would produce a different byproduct. Um, as well, there's also the um, different contaminants are regulated due to um, adverse health effects. And for these, their health effects um, are um, known to be, they can be uh, carcinogens and cause bladder and colorectal cancer, as well as they can cause um, negative effects um, during pregnancies. So we're looking at in this project, um, how these samples are reported. So we're starting off with um, quarterly samples are taken by each community water system and Based on, the, based on the size and extent and the number of people that uh, the CWS will serve, they're gonna take a different number of samples um, for each quarter. Um, this is also like, basically a quarter is gonna be equal to a season. So basically in a quarter, you're gonna take X many samples. And then if, there, if a sample exceeds the MCL, which for um, THM4 is 80 micrograms per liter for that group. And for HA5, it's 60 micrograms per liter. Um, and if the most recent four um, quarters average out to be exceeding that MCL, then a violation is triggered and that violation is reported to the EPA and to the state. Um, however, for this project, we're focusing on exceedances, which are unreported um, or not always reported, I should say. And we're gonna see um, if the uh, violation correctly corresponds to exceedances. The violation is a locational running annual average which is the foremost recent um, quarters average. So really with this project, what we're looking at are the trends and exceedances over time. Are they increasing or decreasing over that 10 year period that we have compiled? Um, and then we're gonna look at where are the exceedances happening within New York state? Are they clustering? Are they everywhere? And kind of analyze that. And then lastly, what we wanna look at is does the current reporting requirements of the LRAA represent the DBP exceedances as they are actually occurring. In order to do this, when we came into this project, um, we had a data set already compiled by our mentor, um, which used the Safe Drinking Water Information System to get all of the violation information. And then from there, we she found um, all of the exceedance data using FOIA requests, using um, direct communication with the CWSs to get their information, and the New York Department of Health, which also reports on exceedances. Um, in order to characterize the data, we used RStudio, ArcGIS, and then we looked at it spatially, temporally, and by county. Looking at um, the seasonal data, which would be the temporal look at the DVP exceedances, um, this is what we found in terms of the mean um, concentration of what the exceedances were by season, as well as the number of exceedances by season split into the two groups for THM4, HA5. Um, something that we did find was that the factor difference between um, the winter and the summer is about, for THM4, is about 10, which is quite high compared to the factor difference, which is about 2.7 for HA5. Um, we're seeing that in the summer months, um, especially for THM4, there is a much higher um, value of exceedances just as like a baseline number. But we also found that the um, average um, concentration of the exceedance averages to be higher than all of the other quarters or all the other seasons, I should say, um, for THM4s. So the summer has the highest exceedances, which is followed by the fall. And then um, 
And for HAA5s, we found that significantly the um, winter months had a lower exceedance than a lower exceedance value than the um, um, rest of the months of the year or rest of the seasons of the year. We're looking spatially now at where these exceedances are. So this is a map of New York State for the THM4 category. Um, and each dot is a location of a community water system that had an exceedance over the past 10 years. The color is um, correlated to the number of um, seasons that the, uh, or yeah, number of quarters over the past uh, 10 years that had an exceedance. Um, so this would be out of 40 quarters, how many, or out of 40 seasons, how many of them had an exceedance and the color coordinates to that. And as well as there's a trend, um, which a logistic regression was run to see are these, um, is there a positive trend? Is there a negative trend? Or is there not really any difference in time? So if we're looking at this um, spatially, um, we found that there were a few hot spots, including Jefferson County around Watertown, as well as Albany um, and the Finger Lakes region. We did see, however, that for THM4, there was um, a few downward trend arrows in Watertown or in Jefferson County, which would indicate possible remediations, although further studies would need to be conducted to further in investigate this. For HA5s, overall, we found that there were less exceedances and less locations of exceedances. Um, but we did find that there were a similar couple locations of hotspots, which would include um, the Jefferson County slash Watertown area and as well as Albany. But the Finger Lakes region did not see as many exceedances um, over the past 10 years as there were for THM4. As far as looking at that LRA analysis to see if that is really representing how many DBC, DBP exceedances are happening, um, we looked at the reported amount of exceedances versus the unreported exceedances. Um, and again, we found that throughout the summer months, there are just way more exceedances happening. Every year, pretty routinely, we found that throughout the summer months, there is a higher chance that the amount of uh, exceedances are going unreported. And overall, we saw that 70% of THM4s and 68% of HAA5s are being unreported. But what we were looking at with this is that this is only really a problem if every summer when that higher number of exceedances is happening would cause adverse health effects. If the LRA is a good representative, like if it, if over the year, if it's high, then there are adverse health effects and that's fine. But it's really, if every year when you get that higher dosage, is that negatively affecting your health? That's when we found that there needs to be further study conducted to really analyze that. Um, for conclusions, for the THM4 concentrations, we found they were in they were the highest in the summer and the lowest in the winter. And um, for HA5s, we found that they were had the lowest concentration values in the winter, as well as just purely number wise. Um, the THM4s had a very high factor difference between the summer and the winter months. And then again, just to reiterate, spatially, those three hotspots were Watertown, Albany, and the Finger Lakes regions, which do follow population centers, but it was just interesting how much they clustered around those regions. We found that there were positive trends for THM4 and HA5 exceedances in the Albany region, um, while there was a negative trend for THM4 exceedances in Jefferson County, which is around Watertown. And that last conclusion is just that the LRA may not be an accurate measure of the number of exceedances, um, but further study would need to be conducted to see if it's important to report on the number of exceedances by season um, to see if it's really hazardous to your health. Yeah, and just a big thank you to Raseel and Scott for our mentors. Um, and if you want to look, we have an ArcGIS map, which kind of puts it together a little bit um, of all the data that we compiled, and you can toggle between THM4 and HA5 categories on there too. So thank you. Any questions? Uh, do you guys have any information on the amount of disinfectant dosed and or where do you know where the actual samples were taken? We don't have um, information on the, the dosage for like the water treatment plant uh, projects. We did look into um, Jefferson County a little bit to see like what was different there, but we didn't look into the uh, their treatment process. Um, but that would be a really interesting thing to kind of try and see if there's any correlations in future studies. Um, and then for your second question, can you repeat it? Do you know exactly where the samples were oh, taken in the system? Yes. 
So we found, um, we don't exactly know where exactly they are, but we found the location of the person who like took the samples of that um, community water system. And we used that um, location as the sample. So, are, you, are you asking about like water age? We don't have, we don't have that information. Yeah. We know it's finished water, but we don't know where in the, where, whatever you believe they took their sample from. So and another question would be why, if those look like maybe more of urban areas where you're seeing higher, Disinfection byproducts. Do you, are there any reasons why that might be that might be true? One of the things we did discuss briefly is that in rural areas they are using wells more, so that uh, data is just not available to know whether or not that is a big problem. Um, but as far as urban areas, I think that's just where the larger CWSs are, because we only looked at CWSs that were non-transient. Yeah, they the. We only looked at a certain type of public water system. But what could drive what could drive the the fluctuations? What what could drive THMs and HAs? Maybe that's like big part. But what about wells? What's so so what's so special about wells? They have lower organic content. So you're starting off with less mm -hmm. things that can react. Um, but for urban centers, do they tend to have more or less samples taken usually? More, more, right? So you're likely probably to find more things if you look more for them. Is another thing. Yeah. Also, you know, an urban area might have a may have a bigger system, more distribution. They may have to hold the water in a secondary tank and then redose yep. it. Yeah. Um, sorry, you got you have a raised hand there too. Yes. Okay. That's all. Sorry. Thank you're you. good. Thank you. It's not in the chat. I don't know. Just no, it's just me. Sorry, <laughs> raising my hand. Um, just a, one thing to point out that I think we discussed in the past is. If you go to the map with all those dots where we've seen those exceedances, I think I remember you telling us that this is effectively the distribution of population in New York. So like this is where people tend to live. So if everything was random in terms of where exceedances are happening, you'd likely see them more where there are more community water systems um, just by random chance. So the, the fact that it's following the population centers could just because there's more chances for exceedances to occur. It's, it's not clear that there's other drivers going on. There could be, but it's just not totally clear. Do you have any final questions? So what happens when there are exceedances? Like what changes have to be implemented either in terms of regulations or just best practices? So we did talk about that. I did ask, you know, what can you do if you are seeing them a lot? One of the things is they change the treatment process on the on the beginning, but also they can add aerators to the water treatment at the on the back end, which can help break up the DBPs um, and try not to hold the water in the tanks for as long afterwards, because the longer it sits before going being distributed, the more DBPs that can be that can like form in that time period. Um, but as far as further regulations, there isn't really any change to like, to like tightening those regulations. And um, I think we're going to now switch over if there's no final questions um, to our next presenters who are Molly and Gianna, and they're going to be presenting on, on their submerged project. It was just making no. All right, thank you for coming. Thank you to uh, the people that are connected on Zoom. My name is Kiana. I'm a master's student in environmental management. And my name is Molly Brown. I'm a rising junior here at Cornell studying environment and sustainability. Our mentor is Rewa Fansalkar and our project is Summers New York. So what is Summers New York? It's a statewide flood resilience uh, and outreach effort that is led by New York Sea Grant, New York State Water Resources Institute, and FEMA. And the focus is to complement communities on flood resilience um, communication creatively through visual markers or public art. Now for uh, this summer, our goal was to create two RGIS story maps. 
In case you're not familiar with ArcGIS Story Maps, it's a web app that allows users to create interactive stories using maps, multimedia, and text in a scrollable way. Now, to create content for these story maps, we conducted four interviews. Three were uh, with the pilot project towns, Hudson, uh, Ossining, and Poughkeepsie. And one with, uh, was with our future pilot project in the Kettle Lakes. Uh, we also analyzed and organized the data that was previously uh, obtained for Summers New York. There were a lot of folders and documents, and we made it available, easily accessible in the story map for users. Uh, we conducted some research uh, on the Kettle Lakes, and uh, lastly, we uh, produced four videos, three for uh, the pilot projects and one promotional video for Summers New York. So now I will show you, um, these are our final products. This is how the um, two story maps look. And I will walk you through the Summers uh, New York story map. I can get to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for that. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. So the, the focus of this uh, story map is that uh, the project becomes um, kind of uh, that communities and artists can come to the story map and use it, use the tools, use the resources and create their own Summers uh, project. So I will just rock, walk you briefly on the different sections, there's an about, se about section which talks about the project. There's flood history. Um, this flood history, actually, it has a map where you can go and zoom in in your own area and look for uh, the flood risks in your area. And uh, it focuses a lot on the pilot projects. There's videos about the pilot projects, as I mentioned earlier. There's quotes for the interview. And the idea with this and this section right here with project ideas is in case you're a community member or an artist and you don't know what to do, but you wanna raise uh, flood resilience, communication and awareness, you can look for ideas here. So this tool right here was created previously for Summers New York. And you can actually select, let's say you wanna do a mural maybe. So you select the mural and eventually we'll ask you about five more questions and at the end, it will give you in the map the different projects that already exist. So that way you can have ideas and create your own project. Now, once you know what you wanna do, you go and they create your own. And this is the most important uh, section for this um, story map because it'll, it gives you step by steps on how to create the project. And it also gives you templates. When we were doing the interviews, something that came up was that there were no resources on how to uh, create a proposal if you were an artist or how to conduct the um, town meeting. And so right here, you can download the templates and uh, it will actually, if you right here, you go to this folder that is public and then it gives you um, the templates that are editable. So you can tailor them for your own project. And so we hope this, um, this story map can bridge those gaps of lack of tools and resources and knowledge about Summers. It actually also has funding information as well. Now we'll pass it to Molly, who will explain her part of the project. Thank you. Yeah, so um, hi everyone. I worked on the Kettle Lakes mural project this summer. Um, so the Kettle Lakes are in Tully, New York, which is just about 20 miles south of uh, Syracuse. And there the Cortland and Onondaga um, yeah, Federation uh, of the Kettle Lakes Association is working on a Submerged New York project um, with um, in collaboration with the WRI. And um, so before I dive in on the story map, I wanna give you a little context on why they chose to do this um, and what they're doing there. So first the Federation has recruited uh, artist Brandon Lazor as an indigenous artist from the Onondaga Nation. And he is going to work with us to create a digital and portable mural. So the portable part of this is going to be so that we can move the mural from lake to lake um, and 
uh, allow to spread awareness for flood resilience to people of all ages. And the digital piece, digital piece will come in with the QR codes. So my part of this project and the purpose of what I'm doing is to educate and inform the artist about what he should include in the mural for, um, for the Kettle Lakes to include geological history and ecological history. So with that, Brandon uh, is known for his vignettes in his paintings so that he can include uh, multiple stories in one. And for this mural with the lakes, he's going to include um, different stories from each of the lakes um, that he will take from this story map. So now to talk more about the story map, um, I learned a lot of interesting things about the history that I wanted to share with you today. And then I'll touch on some gaps that I hope the Federation will consider um, including as they move on um, creating this mural. So when looking at the history, I learned a lot about the geology. So the Kettle Lakes were formed back in the last period of glaciation. So um, when stagnant pieces of ice were buried under sediment, they, the glaciers moved out and these pieces of ice melted and created the Kettle Lakes. Um, however, this means that they are closed basins. So this is gonna make them prone to flooding. Um, and there is a lot of flood history in the Kettle Lakes. Um, and there's buildings and homes built close to the uh, waterfront. So they definitely are impacted because of that. However, Tully, New York is fortunate to have such a strong community um, that cares a lot about these lakes. So when I was doing my research, I learned a lot about community resilience and powerful stories um, from the community. One being after one of their recent storms, uh, the community from Tully and surrounding areas came together uh, to plant over 600 saplings to create a buffer zone between the lakes. Um, and that's just one example, but uh, some of the gaps in the research that I found included, um, there weren't, wasn't a lot of research about interaction between species within individual ecosystems in a lake or between the different lakes. Um, so I think that would be something really interesting to include going forward um, to tell the story of the Kettle Lakes through the mural. Additionally, personal testimonies. As I said, um, there's a really strong community in Tully, New York, and I think including some history from the locals would be really powerful moving forward, and I'd be interested to learn more about it. So ultimately, some takeaways um, from this where funding has been very challenging, as Gianna briefly touched on, um, it's not always accessible to artists and community members. So um, including that kind of information and those templates and documents for planning meetings or grant proposals is going to be extremely helpful. And this has never been easier now with a Gianna story map. So I really look forward to seeing how that changes Submerse going forward. Um, and additionally, community involvement is super important. Uh, as you can see in the Kettle Lakes, the community is rallying around these lakes and cares a lot about um, the, the climate resilience. So having that strength and um, just care from them is going to be important for the success of the project. And finally, there are so many more communities interested in flood resilience uh, through art. And I really look forward to seeing everything that comes of these story maps um, going forward and the many more art projects that are created. So we wanted to thank you so much for listening. Please check out our story maps on these QR codes and a special thanks to all of our mentors and everyone who made this possible. We couldn't have done it without you guys. Thank you so much. Now we have some time for questions. Hey Spencer. <laughs> First of all, it was such a pleasure working with everybody on this, Rewa, Kristen, you guys. Um, I love this project. For other people who might hear this and be interested specifically in the story map part of it, any lessons learned, or or maybe a simpler question is, what was one of the hardest challenges you had in putting this project together this summer on such a tight time scale? Hmm. I think, um, well, thank you for that question. And you were actually part of, you are a part of the answer, Chris, <laughs> because it was the time, so, I Chris was actually in two of our interviews and unfortunately on one of them uh I did not recall the record the whole interview and that's actually something that I learned during this internship which is you know things happen and you have to be honest and I talked with my mentor Rewa and she said you know they will understand you can 
just ask them to maybe do another one. I actually had a plan B to like just send them the written questions, but um, both uh, Chris and Jamie were amazing. They understood, they gave me another opportunity. Uh, so I guess the hardest part was actually kind of accepting that I did something wrong <laughs> and trying to fix it in a way that won't affect anybody. Also, um, one last thing that was challenging a little bit, not that much, it was just time challenge, which was trying to put all the information that was already there for summers. It's this project have been going for some years and there's uh, there were a lot of documents and folders. The tool that I show were in like different places. So it was a little bit challenging to put it all together and show it in an easy way into a story map. Yeah, um, one of my challenges was going into this, I had never heard of the Kettle Lakes uh, or Tully, New York, honestly. So um, it was hard getting that information. It wasn't like the easiest things to find, um, but learning about different ways to um, find data and use different databases, um, I definitely learned a lot about that uh, from Rewa. So I thank her. Uh, but yeah, even just reading like people's master's thesis um, or information from the locals was really helpful, um, especially when it's not the most accessible kind of data. Thanks for the presentation, guys. Really good job. Um, really happy with how the story maps are turning out. Um, this remains a work in progress, and I feel like you have brought it to a really good point uh, that we can sort of take it ahead from. Um, my question is that perhaps like this was one of the only projects that involved y'all actively talking to community members. Um, so you were doing interviews with community members and working directly with Colleen from the Kettle Lakes. I want to know about like how that experience felt. Um, and if, you know, we could have done something to facilitate that in a better way, or is there something different that you learned from talking directly to communities as opposed to just your mentor? Yeah, um, kind of popping off of what I just said, but I think that was a really helpful part of it um, because I had those community members calling in specifically to talk to who knows just so much about these kettle lakes and cares so deeply for them um, that it was honestly really helpful and gave me a new perspective on how I can get information that I need. And it doesn't always just have to be like a Google search. It can um, be a question to a local. And um, I really enjoyed that part of this research, honestly talking to people um, who live there and know the places so well. Yeah, the same, I would say the same. Talking, um, having the interviews um, really help you in such, such a short period of time, which is this internship to understand really well the project. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, there's so many, there's so much information that you could read, but um, actually having the interviews help you to know where to look in all these uh, folders and all these documents. So I highly recommend that if uh, when this project uh, gets the new interns or um, in the future, anybody that takes on the project, it will be a great idea to talk with the people. That's the best way to understand the project and make it um, grow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening. And we're going to hand it off to Tomas and Adrian with their next project. Okay, so hi, my name is Tomas Schmieder. I'm currently a rising junior. I'm studying environmental engineering here. And my name is Dana Cardona Young. I am also a rising junior, also studying environmental engineering here at Cornell in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Just want to start off by saying thank you to WRI and everyone that has helped us out through this process. And of course, our mentors, Maya and Bowser, they helped us out a lot. And so I'll continue with our project, which is a phenological calendar of the Hudson River Valley phenomena for student research. So our project was basically to work with the Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve 
that is located in, at the Nori Point Environmental Center. And they wanted us to create a phenological calendar that highlights key events for important species in the Hudson River Valley, as well as to compile a, a potential list of research topics and questions that could be used for future research at HR and ER. So what is basically the purpose of our project? So the research reserve basically has five locations in the Hudson River Valley, starting up north, there's Stockport Falls, Tivoli Bays, Nori Point, which has the environmental center, Iona Island, and then Piermont Marsh. And they frequently partner with students to con conduct research on certain topics in the Hudson River Valley. But a lot of these projects often face challenges due to time constraints during like the internship timeframe and timing of phenological events that species actually are going through. And so this project aims to cre create like comprehensive resources such as the phenological calendar or the potential research questions that could highlight these key events at specific times that students can then use as resources to, to do these projects. So what actually is a phenological calendar? So a phenological calendar is basically a popular method to educate the, pu the public about the activity of different species. Phenological patterns are repeated behaviors that are exhibited by members of a species over a certain amount of time. By presenting the information in sort of a, a digestible and intriguing format, it draws the audience in and helps them learn more about the natural world around them. And these calendars include important information about these species, such as their migration or hibernation patterns, as well as when they might be exhibiting mating behavior. Information like this allows the public to be aware of the, of, of the activity of nature around them and also helps them begin learning about different behaviors of specific species. Yeah, so basically the way we went about constructing this project is always in the goal of how do we educate people about the nature that's surrounding them? How can they interact with nature in a better way? So we started with just an examination of what species are people encountering in the Hudson Valley. We mainly, we started off with community science uh, websites such as eBird or Nature Survey Explorer to see what animals are people actually just interacting with and which are they encountering in their day to day or when they're going out and looking for animals. This evidently gave a very big list of animals, which also complemented, or animals and plants, which also complemented with a literature review of different sources, such as uh, published literature, uh, nature guides, invasive species guides, hunting and fishing guides, um, all sorts of uh, literature that would just tell us what species of note were found in the area. Since they gave us such a big list of animals, we then tried to narrow it down to what animals specifically are being encountered in the area surrounding um, the research stations that Thomas mentioned, which roughly gives the counties of Westchester, Rockland, Putnam, Orange, Ulster, Dutchess, Columbia, and Green. Still a very big area. So we further narrowed it down. First, we decided, okay, we need to figure out what groupings we can um, Put these uh, species in. So we settled on selecting species from six different taxonomic groups. So plants, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, insects, and aquatic invertebrates, birds, and fish. Uh, we grouped them in this way, specifically grouping insects and aquatic invertebrates in one group and reptiles and amphibians in the other, based on the total number of species we had. Um, so we weren't excluding too many, but also uh, based on the types of patterns of activity that we're going to be seeing with these uh, species, particularly because this calendar isn't going to give you specific information of when to go out and find these animals or what's very specific activity they're gonna do. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, but the idea is to be able to compare how do different animals go about their yearly activities. So you can see that mammals, for example, have a very different calendar to reptiles and amphibians. You can think about warm blooded and cold blooded animals or how animals interact with specific plants. And that is really the goal of this calendar. So we're trying to group animals together to show how they vary within their taxonomic groups and between taxonomic groups. Um, since we had a very big list of animals, we, thanks to the help from uh, Chris and Maya, in addition to researchers, researchers with HRNERR, we were able to select species of special interest, species like the bald eagle, the black bear, uh, the American eel and many others that were going to be particularly interesting for people um, in the area. So we were able to settle on a list of a total of 36 species, six from each group. We originally intended to do 60, but we realized this would make the calendar too crowded. And with these species selected, we were then able to move forward with the actual design of the calendar. So we went through a, very, a series of prototypes, first gathering information of, on a lot of species and then narrowing it down. We used spreadsheets at first, Google Sheets, to lay out these calendars in a flat form to try to see how do their patterns look, how do they overlap, and how can we then use this information to create an engaging and visually appealing calendar. 
Um, as you can see, this, this could vary a lot depending on the different groups. They have very different patterns, and we were also seeing how specific can we go with the information we have. We want to make this calendar educational, but also accessible. We realize that not everybody has the same level of education. If we make a calendar just too crowded, it's going to be difficult to interpret. And additionally, there's going to be some species that are very difficult to show on a yearly calendar. The one that we always mention is a timber rattlesnake, which has a multi-year long mating um, process where they have relations one year, but then they hold overwinter the sperm and then they fertilize in the next spring. This is something that we just can't show very easily on a calendar. So we had to choose specific species that are gonna be easy to understand. Um, once we had the, this flat calendar, we were able to then use Adobe Illustrator and Adobe InDesign to actually make the round calendar. Originally then with the idea of doing six different calendars side by side for the different taxonomic groups, eventually settling on one big calendar to make comparisons easier and for a more visually appealing calendar, which led us to our final design, which is as shows uh, for the people in the room, it's in the wall over there, for the people on the Zoom, we're sharing now. Yeah, so this is the final deliverable version of the calendar. Its dimensions are about 75 by 50 inches. As Adrian said, it was made using software from the Adobe Suite, InDesign, and Illustrator. And it, looking at the calendar, we can see like in the top left, we have sort of our titles as well as logos for WRI and HR and ERR. And you'll notice that some of the text is also in Spanish. And that's because a lot of the other posters that are our at HR and ERR are also in Spanish. So we wanted to follow their sort of um, theme or pattern with inclusivity. Um, in the bottom left corner, you can see that we have a paragraph on how to actually use the calendar. So the calendar portrays the phenological activity of select species that were found in the Hudson River Valley. And so for each ring that's on the calendar, you can see a species name that's in the middle. And if you follow each ring that, if you follow each ring down a certain amount of time, you'll be able to see what their, what that species is actually doing. And depending on the color, looking at the legend in the bottom right, you'll be able to tell what that species might be doing. So for example, like at the very top, we have like this dark, dark blue color. And that, that relates to like the dormancy of the plants. Yeah, if I can add real quick, you can see that there's no specific hard lines. We used a gradient to show that there's a transition between one stage and another. That's because animals don't really follow a specific um, start and end date. As we mentioned in the bottom left corner, there's a note. Uh, the idea here is to show very general um, times where these activities are taking place. And the main goal of this being, of course, comparison, but also um, you know, inspiring people to conduct their own research and ask their own questions, asking why is it that there's a area for um, the juvenile stage for bears in the middle of winter. And many people will go and research the mating process that black bears go through and realize that they actually give birth during their denning period. Um, similarly with migration patterns, see how some animals are living for longer periods of time. Uh, and this allows us to then, you know, inspire these conversations and uh, motivate people to go out and do their own research into the calendar. Alongside the deliverable of the phenological calendar, we produced at least a list of research topics and questions that students could use to guide possible future research. Topics included gaining information about specific species, such as like their migratory patterns or exhibiting different behaviors based on their locations. So thank you so much. Um, we are, we, there's a QR code here if you would like to look at the calendar, you can zoom in, take a closer look look at the phenological information of the different species. Um, we had a great time working on this project. Thank you again to Maya and Chris for helping us make this uh, great calendar. We can't wait to hopefully go and see it in person. It'll be posted up at Nori Point Research Station at the Nori Mills State uh, Park, I believe, on the Hudson River. So feel free to go there and check it out. And any questions, we're gonna have to take them. For you. So for um, first of all, thank you so much. It's it's impressive to see in person, and I I I'm, I've loved seeing this unfold over the summer. Um, I my question is about the research questions piece. So could you talk a little bit more about how you compiled those questions, and then if those questions are available, and, and how you how you how you plan to use them? Yeah, so the questions were prepared in part based on previous questions that have been developed by HR and ERR. 
uh, just looking at examples, but then also looking at what research our current research search is doing. So we're looking at which species were they specifically following to make note of them. Additionally, what types of research they were doing. We asked them, how can students help you conduct your research? And then we ended up going for different routes of grouping them by topic uh, with some more general questions and some very specific questions. Uh, the idea is not to necessarily grab these questions and run with them, but give them an idea of what types of questions um, are these research projects looking to um, get answers so they can come up with their own questions based on what interests they have. And additionally to what research is going on currently at the moment when they're engaging in their own research to be able to maybe do something that can help uh, researchers with the HR and ERR uh, move forward. So some examples we gave um, are about specific locations, specific animals, um, potentially weather events additionally. Uh, so there's a wide variety of questions that they can take from there, um, but all with the goal of helping advance the research that are that researchers are doing. Uh, Bowser? So less a question and just, just wanted to express a huge amount of thanks to you two. Um, it was so impressive, the amount of work, the amount of detail, the incredible professionalism that you brought to this. I, it was just so excellent working with you. And um, I don't know what you guys are gonna be doing in your future careers, but whoever gets to work with you is gonna be extremely psyched to do so. So thank you very, very much for everything you put into this. Thank you, Bowser. Thank you, oh, that does remind me, I wanna give an extra shout out and thank you to Aishwarya Shankar who helped us get an introduction into the Adobe Illustrator and also Phenological Candors in general. She's worked with them. Um, so thank you to her a lot for helping us get started with this project. I'm not sure if there's any questions in the chat. No? Okay. Never mind. All right. Anything else? No. I guess I could ask. <laughs> so if you were given more time, what do you see any future directions you would take this this these efforts in if, if you had unlimited time and resources? Yeah. At the maybe sort of like in the middle of when we were still like working on the calendar and stuff, we were thinking about like maybe like a more accessible way of creating the calendar, or maybe not accessible, but basically putting like an online resource of the calendar, but uh, maybe like a public resource where people could put their information for multiple species into like sort of just a giant like database. So then that calendars could then be like created like automatically, maybe like a, like a coding like website sort of piece, rather than just having 36 species, having like as many that you could keep adding on to. Yeah, I mean, reason for that is also that there's so many species that could be included, so many that have very interest phenological activity that we couldn't fit into our calendar. So being able to give people a chance to visualize those, specifically choose which species to look at to be able to do that comparison to help drive the curiosity that people have, help them access it when they can't be in person at the uh, Nori Point Research Station um, are all things that can help make the um, project just uh, more... Um, accessible to people because the big goal of this has been how do we educate people. Um, I remember having a very interesting conversation with Ben, our communications director on the way down to the Hudson Valley, about how important education is in efforts to do conservation. Uh, so this really is the purpose of this project to help educate people about what is the nature around them doing? How can they go out and interact with it? What patterns can they expect them to be doing? So being able to expand it to more species would be really, uh, really great. Uh, Russell? Um, oh, oh. Uh, um, well, actually, so you mentioned about like an interactive component, um, and and maybe like, creating the calendar in future iterations, you know, to uh, get a sense of how climate change might be shifting phenological adaptations. Yeah, and so the, I thought that would be so like an interesting thing. Like if you could have something like this up with an interaction, and people can. Okay. Oh, I'm seeing this particular nesting species, right? And kind of crowdsourcing, you might see clusters of yeah. shifts that, um, you know, would be helpful to track over time. No, definitely. I think one of the big things is also a lot of information varies a lot. We saw different sources say that this animal starts this behavior in this time, fear or the other. For example, bald eagles migrate when the waters are freezing over. So that's something that's definitely going to be changing with time. As years get hotter, as lakes and rivers freeze over less, we're going to see migration pattern shift. So that is absolutely something that 
having the ability to change is going to be really important. This will be, you know, printed up and hopefully there for a long time, but it's very true that the patterns that we're showing here might very well change based on temperature uh, changes to climate change. All right, well, we're almost out of time. So if there's any other questions, we'd be more than happy to, yeah, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, at the end, we'll have a little bit of a chance. Uh, we'd like to invite now Sarah Cook to do her presentation on mercury in wetlands. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. So in case you forgot, my name is Sarah Cook and I'm a rising senior studying environmental engineering here at Cornell. Um, so for my project today, um, I was working on comparing mercury research among different wetland morphologies. So a little bit of background on the on this topic. Um, mercury is a is very toxic in its inorganic and organic form, and as well as it being um, more toxic in the organic form. Um, and it is also more likely to accumulate um, and uh, mobilize um, into the web, into the food web when it's in the organic form, which would be um, for this project methyl mercury or MEHG. Wetlands are also a major source and sink for um, mercury in part due to their high levels of dissolved organic matter. And um, they receive um, mercury through atmospheric deposition and runoff. Some of the sources of mercury are um, burning fossil fuels, mine tailings, smelting of minerals such as lead and copper. Um, and then there are also natural sources such, such as volcanic eruptions and ocean evapotranspiration. Um, here in New York State, uh, we receive a lot of burning, burning of fossil fuels from coal plants in the West. Um, and as well as there's been an increase in the past time um, where the amount of mercury in the atmosphere has increased between two and five fold um, since industrial industrialization has begun, um, which would really increase the amount of mercury that is available to um, accumulate into different locations such as wetlands. The different wetland categories that I worked with this summer are um, gonna start with marshes, which are continually flooded with soft stem vegetation and they often have a neutral pH. Swamps, which are seasonally flooded with um, dominated by woody plants, which would be trees or shrubs as well as they have a variable pH. Bogs, where the main source of water for bog is precipitation, which makes this a very um, low, in, low in minerals, um, this wetland, which would create an acidic wetland. And they also have peat presence, which is basically a spongy moss. Um, fens are similar to bogs in that they have peat presence, but they have a higher level of minerals due to groundwater being the main source for fens and which this would give them a more neutral pH. The objective of this project is to identify wetland types with the greatest propensity for mercury mobilization based on data compiled from previous peer-reviewed research. For the methodology for this project, I started with a um, search category on Web of Science, and then what I'm saying is yes or knowing an article, so that's saying if this article falls into the scope of this project, and then collecting that data to work with. So this is the um, Web of Science search that I worked with. It included um, mercury being inside of the article, as well as some term for a wetland. Um, also, there was terminology for um, total and methylmercury. Um, so you could find the percent methylmercury, um, as well as water or soil, which were the um, locations of mercury concentration in wetlands that was um, looked into. Once an article was yesed, um, we were collecting data, but in order to get to that point, we had to say like, what was a yes article? So an article that would fall into the scope of this project would be a natural wetland. This would mean that it wouldn't have any experimental manipulation and it wouldn't be man-made. So it's not a constructed wetland. Um, there would also be, um, it would include soil or water, total and methylmercury, which would give us the percent methylmercury. And also the wetland would have to be a non-point source for their mercury. Point source uh, mercury found in wetlands could be due to maybe it's downstream of a mining plant um, 
and there's gonna be a higher level of mercury in the water or in the soil there due to unnatural um, and, and man-made um, anthropogenic sources. So once we collected the data, an analysis was conducted in our studio to see what the results were. Um, so the data collected mostly spanned um, marshes followed by swamps, fens, and bogs. For the purpose of this uh, project, I didn't get through all 2000 articles, but taking a sampling of what we could get through in the, in the 10 week summer program. Um, but it was important to know that there was a majority of marshes that were um, looked at, which is um, helpful to know because it's very key habitat and with juvenile fish. And um, it's very important to the food web looking at that. Um, as well as locations of these wetlands were mainly focused in North America and in China. Um, this would mean that um, based on looking at English language articles, this would make sense for more wetlands being found in North America since there are more English speaking countries. And there are many wetlands in China due to their rice production. So that would um, influence um, more research being done there. Looking at freshwater wetlands at their water uh, percent methylmercury, I found the average um, percent methylmercury between the wetlands. And there's a box plot shown of this information. Um, statistically significant findings were shown to be marshes were um, had more percent methylmercury than fens. Um, the other comparisons, however, did not show to have uh, st statistical significance, which be, could be due to many things such as just uh, the amount of data compiled and the amount of um, wetland categories that were able to be covered. Um, there were 97 wetlands looked at, but since the maj vast majority were going to be marshes, it limited um, the other locations. Um, Looking at their soil methyl methylmercury, um, you can see that there is quite a jump between fens and basically the other types of wetlands, although this wasn't found to be statistically significant. So more research would have to be um, supplemented here in order to find um, more um, stable results. Looking more so into marshes, since so much um, um, so many marshes were able to be collected, we split up based on water type. So um, there were fresh marshes, estuary waters, and also salt waters. And it was seen that the averages were um, decreasing with increased salinity. Um, although these averages were not found to be stati statistically significant, so more research would have to be done in order to um, look more into this. Um, so overall, we're concluding that fens have a lower percent methylmercury in their waters than marshes. And it's also important to note that we looked at percent methylmercury because it's a good kind of baseline to look across multiple categories. So methyl mercury is the percent of total mercury that is organic, which would be the percent of mercury that's been mobilized. Um, the majority of the data was found in marshes in North America. Um, and this is also a key habitat, which is makes sense for, it's a good information to have, but also it might produce a knowledge gap for other um, habitats in um, other wetlands that might need more research done as well on this issue. Um, and also for the next steps for taking this analysis, I found that there were many important factors which play into mercury methylation. And these category groups being the wetland types might be a little bit too broad. There's a lot of different characteristics that go into what makes a wetland. And I think more specific categorizations would be helpful in terms of finding out where are gonna be the hot spots of finding mercury methylation um, like where in the world, what type of wetland, what are the different things. So if you're looking at where are the uh, locations to, um, you know, prioritize your efforts and prioritize um, money and research, these could be um, good things to look into for future uh, analyses done. So thank you so much to my mentor, Evie, for working with, working with me on this. And um, any questions? Um, Brian. <laughs> sure, I guess, um, given the fact that the study sites were all over the planet, what would you say, is there anything, any sort of specific relevance to New York that you sort of came across or were pulled from that? Looking at New York, um, one thing that was important to note was that there was um, the non, there was a lot of non-point source mercury, which would be from um, 
an, a higher level of atmospheric mercury due to um, coal plants um, in the Northeast and, and in like the Northwest. Um, in New York, there's a, since there's, we have Great Lakes, there's a higher number of, um, there's a quite like, there's a lot of wetlands to look into. Um, and also these wetlands have different characteristics based on, you know, how they're being seasonally flooded. Are these changing um, where there are hot spots? Because sometimes based on the type of wetland and the type of their seasonal flooding, um, and if there's more flooding or less flooding, that creates different hot spots for mer mercury mobilization, which is important to know. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> okay. okay, just on that, like how does, what's the gradient for flooding frequency in mercury? Like if you're inundated, you have more methyl mercury than if you're more infrequently. Yeah, inundated. so that was outside of the scope of this project. Okay. So I can't speak directly to that. Um, but what was found was that, so if we're looking at the water percent methyl mercury, it was found significant that marshes had more, uh, Meth more percent methyl mercury than fens. And if you think about those two wetlands separately, like marshes ha are continually flooded. It's kind of like there's a certain depth and there's just kind of going to always be water there where fens you could look at and it might not even look like there's a wetland present. So that would be a much lower percent of like standing water, which would be important to note as well. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, ask about one of your conclusions was about, you know, look, maybe looking at a finer wetland classification mm -hmm. that might kind of tease out some differences. I guess I'm curious to hear about, I know you, you ended up putting, it's always tricky. There aren't a lot of standardized, um, well, there are many ways to classify wetlands and studies use lots of different approaches. And you came up with these, you know, wise for buckets to put them in. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is when you looked at the studies, was it difficult to put them into those buckets based on the classifications or was it relatively straightforward? Um, that actually did filter out some of the articles that were able to be yes, because some articles would just include, here's a wetland, here's the percent methyl mercury, here's the total mercury found. And although they would say, a few characteristics. Sometimes there's a there's a number of characteristics that you have to look for in order to make a categorization. And for determining that categorization and determining which category it falls in, um, a lot of times there were there was not enough information given, and it was more a generalized um, information about the site. Um, so without more information, I wasn't able to categorize it, and therefore it was like I wasn't able to look into it in this study. Um, and I think that's a good point too, because making that category of what the wetland would be. Um, there was also a lot of research done on reservoirs and lakes mm -hmm. in which depending on where those samples are taken, it could be falling within the wetland category. Although, um, you know, if there's no temporal variation in uh, the water level and if it's in like the middle of a lake, I that counted that out of this, the, uh, the scope for wetlands for this project, which did um, decrease the number of articles that could be found from that initial search category, just in so much, um, you know, research is done for drinking water in reservoirs, for example. So, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of maybe why marshes are so well studied, you know, well relative to some of these other wetlands? I think um, marshes are, given this is me speculating, so, you know, no one put this in stone, mm -hmm. um, but I think marshes are looked at more heavily um, due to their amount of water and amount of fish that are present in the in marshes, like in a bog or a fen. Yes, there's definitely a lot of different um, types of uh, like aquatic life, but there's going to be a lot more aquatic life with deeper water. And you can have more fishes, which is um, if you have more fish or juvenile fish, then that's a way for um, mercury to be made into the food web more directly, since fish is probably um, a main source for it coming back to humans. Since if, if, if it's like gets into the water and into the soil, then it um, fish could uptake it and people fish to eat. So um, I think that's why the marshes could be looked at a little bit more intensely with a finer tooth comb than uh, some of the other uh, locations, as well as it goes into the fact that there was a lot of research on reservoirs and lakes 
since th those are more um, locations that humans would have more direct um, impacts from. So yeah, and I think now we're gonna move on to the next um, project, which is Molly gonna talk about um, community science. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good afternoon again. Um, my name is Molly Corley. I'm a second year master's student um, studying, graduate student studying master. My, geez, I'm so sorry. I'm getting my master's of public administration. It's so cold in here. I don't know if anyone else is freezing. I am a popsicle. But I'm going to be talking about community science for riparian restoration monitoring. So when looking at community science for riparian restoration, um, we set out three project goals. The first was to review the um, goals of New York state programs and the riparian functions they're seeking to enhance. The second was to research existing community science tools that are being used to monitor riparian restoration. And the third is to explore community science tools or other approaches um, that have not been used for riparian monitoring, but that could be, that could be adapted for it. So riparian systems are um, the area between the upland and the shoreline. Um, a lot of people think of them as the areas between next to streams and rivers. That's kind of the most common, like what people think of as riparian systems. Um, some of their functions are that they reduce magnitude and flooding, uh, frequency of flooding, especially downstream. Um, they provide shade and headwater systems, which helps keep uh, uh, water temperature down. Um, they aid in erosion control through roots, which can help stabilize banks, and they filter out contaminants um, and improve overall water quality, especially anything coming off of roads or agriculture or contamination. They can really help to filter that out before it goes into the water. As far as community science, um, I'm sure people have heard the term citizen science, but we're really shifting to community science because it's more it's a more inclusive term and includes communities that might feel excluded by the term citizen. Um, when we started looking at them, we were looking at um, the frameworks and the different ways that community members can be involved in projects, starting with level one, just using people as sensors, which is a great way to get people involved at a very surface level and have them help add uh, to data collection. But as you move up the level of engagement, what we're really looking for is um, community science projects where people are involved in the decision making process, where they move beyond just sensors and that they are identifying pro uh, problems and wanting to be a part of that process to help rectify them um, so that you break down the barrier between, you know, scientist, program manager, and uh, community member and just have them all on the equal playing field. So as far as getting at that uh, first goal of the New York State program scan, I looked at about 15 programs in New York State that had goals that support riparian restoration efforts. These were at the state, local, regional, and even um, not uh, government levels. They were included coalitions and um, kind of community-led efforts. And what I found was that there's large amounts of funding available within the state for restoration. Um, I'm sure people are familiar with the Environmental Bond Act, which has $4.2 billion for restoration in New York State. Not all of that is for riparian restoration, but there's a lot of goals within it that are tangentially linked to riparian restoration. And throughout these programs, there's an overall lack of monitoring. A lot of them set really lofty goals without setting any sort of long-term monitoring plan, which, you know, in the long-term could hurt them because if you're not getting that quantifiable data and showing to policymakers that you are actually um, causing change, then you're missing out on a really important part of restoration efforts. Um, and there are four statewide goals that a lot of these programs were hitting on, which were improving water control, flood prevention, erosion control, and enhancing biodiversity, which riparian restoration um, gets at all of these goals. Looking at one pro uh, program in particular, we're looking at the Hudson River Trees for Trips program because Beth Rossler, the director, was a mentor on this project and is really looking to um, update some of her monitoring protocols. The Trees for Trips program provides trees and trips to private and public landowners um, to help them restore their riparian zones. So some challenges facing her program are there are 400 plus sites in the Hudson River Valley. So it's really spread out. Um, they're at varying growing stages. Some have just recently been planted and some have been growing for over 10 years. It's on, some of these sites are private land, which means it's harder to get to without permission. Um, and some of it's on public land. And then the program capacity to conduct monitoring. There's only two people working for this program and they just don't have the capacity to really get out and monitor every single site. 
Um, some opportunities for them are that the program is 20 years old now, so they have a lot of different areas at, at different growing stages, so they could go out and get data on five-year, 10-year, and 20-year restoration efforts. Um, they're looking to update their protocol right now and kind of revitalize that monitoring effort. And there's a bunch of technology now that would aid in monitoring. There's uh, better enhancements in technology so they could gather more data. Some of their past projects are, they tried to do a master watershed volunteer project where they trained people who could then go out and conduct uh, monitoring, but that didn't really pan out. They've also tried photo reporting just to get some photo um, information. And they've also tried connecting with landowners just to keep up with monitoring efforts. For the second goal, the current monitoring tools, it was a little bit difficult to find uh, projects that included the community science piece in a riparian restoration effort um, that also had a monitoring protocol. But if you'll follow along on the river with me, the first three, the Mohonk River Stream Watch, which is in New York State, the RIV-V phone app, which came out of Italy, and the Morph phone app from the UK, they all are community science tools based on using surveys for monitoring. They uh, collect different indicators, including invasive species monitoring, um, water quality data, and even sometimes using macroinvertebrate surveys to collect data on restoration efforts. And they all use different, the two of them are phone apps, so you can kind of collect that information directly on your phone or by using a paper survey, um, which were all really unique ways of trying to get at that monitoring data. And then the second two, the temperature gauges and the macroinvertebrate surveys were both using high school students um, for projects that use high schoolers. Um, the temperature gauges went a little bit further at just an indicator, but was really looking at where are these restoration efforts changing the actual water uh, temperature. And then the macroinvertebrate survey was also kind of getting at that, is the actual habitat changing with the restoration efforts? The last goal was looking at applicable tools that could be um, used in conjunction with monitoring protocols. One of the ones that we really were exploring were popular phone apps, such as iNaturalist, Merlin, iMap Invasive, and eBirds. These are apps that are really well known, they're trustworthy, everyone has access to them, um, and they're very user-friendly. And one of the best things that a lot of these apps do is help in species identification, which could be really vital to monitoring efforts, is getting people who, you know, if you don't know what the species are, you can't help, but these phone apps could supplement and help people identify invasive species. Um, the Restoration Assessment Initiative was also, that's a initiative coming out of the UK, which is looking at standardizing restoration monitoring protocol. They're looking at stream quality and river quality, but a lot of their metrics could be used in riparian zones. Um, the Flow Photo Explorer is actually not so much for community science. They're using trail cams to monitor stream flow, especially at headwaters. But this could be used in conjunction with monitoring protocols by taking people, you know, you don't have to use the people as sensors, you could use them to further analyze data at a later state. Um, and it's also really inexpensive to use trail cameras for monitoring. And then lastly, the Chronolog tool is a uh, community science powered tool where people can go out and take photos using like a phone cradle so that every photo is taken from the same position. Um, and it creates a time lapse that then anyone could go in and look at and observe visible changes over time, which could also be helpful for monitoring uh, protocols. So some next steps. Throughout this project, I found that community science programs have the potential to improve monitoring efforts. They were proven over and over again that these community scientists are able to collect valuable data that can be used by scientists and researchers. And that by involving community members, you're broadening the societal impact of ecological restoration. And then some potential strategies for a community science monitoring project um, to involve some of these tools would be to pilot pro, pi, do a pilot program creating a survey that utilizes phone apps to help community members collect data. Um, and then potentially using community members who are already natural stewards, like anglers, getting people who are already out there to then be a, in a larger community science project. Um, and specifically for the Trees for Tribs program, something that we talked a lot about was connecting community members with local sites that are being restored prior to training them. So that way, once they are trained in monitoring, they know where they're going and can be and are able to go out and conduct that monitoring in a local place that they feel connected to. Yeah. Thank you so much to my mentors, Kristen Hitchka and Beth Rossler. Uh, if you don't have any questions. I have a question. Um, 
as a person who tends not to use apps, I'm curious, um, did you try any of the apps that you just mentioned? I did. So, did you actually like any of them? Um, the, I don't know. So iNaturalist has a user-friendly seek version, um, which lets you, when you go out and identify things, you can earn badges. They've really gamified it, um, which I really love. And it's really good for kids too. So that one was good. And I've also, so I wasn't able to mention in, there are some other monitoring tools, like there's a LiDAR enabled app. Um, if you have an iPhone, you can actually use LiDAR on certain versions for scanning tree diameters. And I didn't, I don't have an iPhone, so I couldn't use this one, but I saw some videos of people using it and it looked really cool. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a good presentation. So as you mentioned, you are using this data and photos for decision makers, right? Mm -hmm. How could you make sure the data collected by the community is qualified and can you know, a good reflection of this real condition that the, well, people who live in this area may be not very good at the data collecting and just assuming make assumptions here. That definitely is something that people using these are running across is that, you know, the they're taking photos and they ask them to take it in a cradle so that every photo is taken from the same position. But depending on your camera, the zoom, how you're doing it really, it does affect the photo quality. Um, so they do have the people using it have an ability to take out any photos that they don't think you know, fit in. And sometimes you do get photos of random people or things that aren't exactly what you want. So you can filter out some of those photos that don't fit into that timeline, but it is definitely a big consideration um, on the back end of how they're analyzing them. Thank you. So what role do you think community science should be taking in general research efforts? Like, is it something we can rely on? I don't want to say solely, but what a lot of like reliance on or should be more of a supplementary thing. And if I think that as we move forward, it should be more, it should be in the decision making. Like if you are going to do a large scale, you know, monitoring effort or any sort of restoration, I think you should consider using community science just because of the ways that it, you know, if you're going to go in somewhere and try and do a restoration effort, not involving the community, um, you know, you're losing out on a lot of information. People know more about their local areas than if you were just to go in and try and do a project. So I think using community members and community science, like you should definitely consider it. And as we go forward, like we're only showing that the data that they're able to collect is aiding in these projects. I'll look to that. D did you, in your work, did you come across um, concerns or considerations about equity? Yes. Um, one of the reasons that people like using community science is because it, it does involve members of the community, but there are some problems with equity because there these projects are happening in areas that are already, you know, relatively wealthy or people are already, you know, they care about their environment. But sometimes these community pro science projects aren't happening where, you know, there isn't already an interest. Um, so there was some, you know, if you aren't specifically trying to get to communities that aren't always the like forefront or maybe aren't desirable communities, um, you miss out and there is some equity issues with community science. Any other questions? Oh, yes. So what is typically uh, outcomes of a community science? Just want to curious, like a way it's all been similar, like a academia, like a publication or mm -hmm. project report or something. Yeah, so there was um, one of the surveys I mentioned, the macro invertebrate survey. Um, that was they used high schoolers to collect over, I think it was a two year period to collect different information about a restoration um, project. And then they did go in with scientists and collect information at the same time. And they compared those two results of what the high schoolers collected versus the scientists and found that there wasn't a significant difference. And they used what the high schoolers collected in a publication um, and were able to like use that data for further research. If that is, oh, sorry. Yeah, so you mentioned where you think people should. Do you think in general the scientific community accepts the validity of community science or is there a lot of doubt cast? I think uh, the question posed about how reliable is it? Do people trust it? I think so several of the studies that I was looking at in the last two years, people have really been pushing it and there's been a lot of research saying that this is valuable data and we should be using it. If you go a little bit older than that, there was some times where they were like questioning whether or not that data was valid and if they were gonna just have to recreate it themselves. But in the past couple of years, people have really started to look at 
creating it as a like trustable source. Yes, thank you so much. If there are any other questions, um, there'll be a period afterwards, but up next will be Molly and Gianna uh, with the Great Lakes Action Agenda. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. For those who are just joining us, my name is Molly. I'm a rising junior here at Cornell studying environment and sustainability. And my name is Gianna Haro. I'm a master's student in environmental management. Our project is the baseline conditions for New York Great Lakes Action Agenda. And we want to give a quick thank you to our mentors who helped us a ton throughout this, Lexi, Ryan, Emily, and Kenji. So let's first start off talking a bit about what exactly the Great Lakes Action Agenda is. So this is a strategic ecosystem-based management plan, which uh, aims to guide restoration, conservation, and sustainability through the Great Lakes, the New York Great Lakes subbasins. Uh, so there are six goals in total, which include topics like aquatic toxicity, habitat conservation, and um, community resilience. However, um, there, well, there are also some cross-cutting priorities, which include environmental justice and education. However, we only focused on two of these goals. The first goal being goal number two, which focuses on uh, water quality for aquatic ecosystems, recreation, and public health, as well as goal number two, or goal number three, which focuses on the prevention and control of invasive species. So a little bit about why we're creating these baseline conditions. This is going to allow us to analyze the progress made over the next several years as we begin to implement these action items. Um, so another quick note before we get into it, uh, we're gonna be referencing the Great Lakes subbasins uh, frequently throughout this pre presentation. So here's a map of the four subbasins that we will be referring to. So I worked on goal number two and the specific action items that I focused on were trends in beach advisories and closures, as well as trends in harmful algal blooms. So to begin, I started pulling from data from the New York Parks Department and the New York Department of Health. Um, so I decided to work with two different metrics, reliability and recovery. Reliability, I defined as the percent of time each beach is open. And I use the equation one minus closures divided by the full season. The second uh, value I used was recovery. This is defined as how quickly a beach reopens or bounces back after a closure. And I uh, use the equation of the joint probability uh, of being closed and the next state being open divided by the probability of being closed. So using these two values, I was able to create this plot. Um, I first want to note that the optimal value is one, um, and we average these values across the four subbasins. So immediately you can see that uh, reliability is pretty high across the board, nearing one. However, recovery is much more variable. So this is going to happen in beaches where there are few closure rates that seemingly open most of the time. However, um, the recovery tells us that this is not really the case. This means that when the beaches do close, they're going to stay closed for several days at a time. Um, and now this is going to kind of key us into uh, potential underlying factors for the beach accessibility. Um, and the recovery kind of gives us a new perspective uh, on this data that we wouldn't have known just looking at reliability. So the next data set that I uh, looked at was from New York State data about harmful algal blooms. So I was able to create these four dumbbell plots for the four different subbasins. Um, this is going to tell us about the seasons of algal blooms and the trends across a 10-year period from 2012 to 2022. Uh, we want to note that there is an observer bias depending on when the first and last observation is reported. Um, however, we can still see the, trend, the general trends across the 10-year period, um, and this is going to be a great baseline condition to look at going forward as trends change throughout time. So ultimately, we decided that our final product should go beyond these baseline conditions, and we wanted to have an educational outcome. So after deciding that, a fact sheet made the most sense. 
Um, so I combined my research on beach closures and harmful algal blooms um, and put it together in a comprehensive guide for the indicator for goal number two. Uh, check out this QR code to learn more about it. It'll also be at the end of our presentation. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening to this portion of the presentation. And now to Gianna for goal three. Thank you, Molly. So as she explained earlier, goal number three focuses on preventing and controlling invasive species from impacting waterways and riparian areas and maintaining a healthy uh, Great Lakes ecosystem and economy. And my focus uh, during this summer was to analyze and to look at decreasing trends in new infestations of both aquatic and terrestrial invasive species in the New York area. For some background, invasive species are species that are introduced usually by humans to a new place that lack their natural predator and therefore they become a problem for the ecosystem, the economy and human health. And the Great Lakes area is actually experiencing these problems because of invasive species. Uh, the approach we took with the approach we took for this project uh, was to use imipinvasive.org, uh, uh, which uh, Molly explained is a community uh, science tool, which can be used by anybody. So you will collect any information on invasive species and put it in the app. So we downloaded data for a 10 year span starting on 2014 for 10 uh, invasive species that were previously selected by the GLAA team. After that, um, we analyzed more than 37,000 data points with Excel, QGIS, and our studio. And out of those uh, 37,000, we extracted more than 15,000 to create maps and animations and analyze the spread of the species, invasive species. For example, this animation shows the spread of uh, water chestnut, which is one of the invasive species. And it's showing uh, the different colors that you see appearing in the dots belong or represent each year, starting from 2014 until 2024. Here are all the animations for all 10 species. And what we found interesting uh, by uh, performing these animations was that you can only, not only see the spread, but also where the spread and which waterways was the spread, for example, in aquatic species uh, being produced. For example, if you look on the round globby one, so the second uh, from the left on the top, you can actually see clearly where this uh, aquatic fish species, um, what, which waterway it was used to um, develop the spread. And as Molly mentioned earlier, we developed fact sheets. This is a fact sheet for the uh, invasive species part of the project. Uh, it compiles all the data and uh, also interesting observations, for example, that in 2023, the lake areas of basin only had 12 observations compared to 200 and 600 in the other sub basins for the same year. Also, the fact sheet itself has a QR code that uh, takes you to a folder that is publicly uh, available and it has maps, it has spreadsheets, it has an, all the animations that I show. For example, one of the maps that you can find is the one that you see right here, which shows the correlation or the intersection between uh, disadvantaged communities and invasive species presence, which is something that we found interesting to maybe look at in future research. So for our takeaways, uh, we found out that recovery and rel reliability are tractable indicators of beach accessibility. Also uh, the uh, dumbbell plus that you saw uh, help us understand better uh, the bloom season for, for the algal blooms, which can serve as a baseline uh, for future research. As I mentioned earlier, with the only 12 observations in Lake Erie compared to 200 and 600 for the other sub basins, we saw that there was a lot of bias observation in the invasive species part of the project as well. So this suggests maybe a reevaluation of the way the data is being collected. And we definitely hope there will be more research um, that involves invasive species presence, but also other factors such as wild fish and wildlife habitat presence or disadvantaged community presence. We would like to thank our mentors again, the WRI staff and interns. And in case you didn't have time to check or download our fact sheets, you can uh, 
scan our QR codes right here. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. So you, in your conclusions, you talked a little bit about reliability, and I guess hearkening back to our discussion about community science, can you talk a little bit more about bias in in data collection in the data that you're using for? Yeah, so so it was interesting because when Molly was explaining how um, scientists and maybe like policymakers want or should take into consideration community science. Uh, we definitely agree. I definitely personally agree with that. Uh, but we also saw that, especially in my portion of the of the project, how by allowing anybody at any time to upload the information might not provide a um, baseline that helps you as a scientist or as a researcher to know, okay, I'm gonna use this data for these years because it was taken regularly and it will help me provide some in output that can actually help with like the baseline permissions. So I do agree that community science, I, I use it, I love it, uh, but um, maybe there should be maybe more, um, I don't know, uh, communication about what it is, how it is, or maybe go to disadvantaged communities as well and make make it more equitable so the data is more reliable. I have kind of a two-part question. Um, for invasive species, you looked at um, things like cattail, and I think this question goes maybe for some of the other species as well, I forget how many were listed, but um, my first question is, um, what species are you looking at, the invasive narrow leaf or the hybrid or, or both? Mm -hmm. um, and then was that kind of an issue? I think this might go for like things like Pagmedia as well, where there's also a native version. Um, was, was that an issue with some of your, your data? How did you encounter that? Yeah, so at first, um, so I'm not from here, as you can tell by my very small accent. <laughs> and so all of these species were completely new to me, although they are invasive, they're not found where I'm from. And so at first, when we got the list and we decided which one to look at, I went directly on my map, I map invasives. And I will type, for example, cattail, and I thought there was only one. There were multiple ones. So uh, we decided at the end to download all of them, uh, just extracting the ones that were native, so all of the invasive species, and just combining them uh, with one name. So anytime I refer to like cocktail species, I will only refer to the invasive and all of the invasives that are here. Yes. Thanks, guys. I, I want to make sure did somebody talk to Anna about this? project by any chance? And if not, can you? Um, <laughs> yeah, or will you guys go? Um, please. I talked to Anna a little bit. But also, as long as she's aware. Yeah. So, so she, it's great. Uh, I just want to make sure she's there. She's always there. Yeah. And the picture, the round W picture was, um, it, it's her photo. So yeah, she definitely helped as well. And she's aware. Thank you. Anna says I'm here. So. <laughs> Alrighty, if that's everything, uh, next up, Tomas and Adrian again for our final project today. Thank you. Okay, um, so my name, again, once again, my name is Anakar Dalayan. I'm a rising engineer. I was an engineering in the College for Doctrine and Life Sciences. And again, I'm Tomas. I'm also a rising junior studying environmental engineering. 
So we're going to present today our project on environmental factors impacting the biotransformation of PFAS in biosolids. Uh, big thank you to our mentors, uh, Drs. Natalie Capiro, Peng Fei Yan, and Shang Dong. They helped us so much with this project, and it does a uh, pleasure work. So to start off with, what are biosolids? Biosolids are nutrient-rich organic matter. They, during the treatment of wastewater, li uh, liquids and solids are separated at we wastewater treatment plants. And the byproduct is these solids, which are removed, and there are a lot of organic matter. So this is organic matter that typically is just going to go to waste if it's not used in different ways. The main um, part of biosolid use that we're focusing on is land application to agricultural land. Um, However, other disposal methods include landfill disposal or incineration. Incineration is very expensive and landfill disposal is just wasting all these nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, which are great for agricultural products. Um, with biosolids, you can treat them to remove pathogens, make them safe for use, which is a big concern a lot of people have, make them safe for use in terms of the pathogens that they may contain. Um, and there's also regulations surrounding, for example, heavy metal, um, presence in biosolids, so when they are applied to agricultural land, they can replace synthetic fertilizers, for example, which can be harmful, which can be very expensive. Um, so this is a very beneficial way of, re of um, increasing sustainability and making agricultural products um, just more beneficial for society. Uh, so then what are PFAS? PFAS are parent polyfluorochal substances. They're a group of thousands of synthetic chemicals that are used in many consumer products and industrial processes. They've come up in the last 20 or so years. Um, there's a great movie, Dark Waters, about how they came into the forefront of you know, um, environmental protection and many issues. Uh, they're using a lot of non-stick pans, plastic packaging, waterproof gear, and aqueous firefighting foam because they're surfactants, which means that they're um, good at preventing stuff from sticking to them. This means that things like fireproof children's clothes or many plastic pro products that are used often disposably had PFAS. And what this resulted in is that they go into the environment. So PFAS are long chains of carbon fluoride bonds, fluorine bonds, which is the strongest bond in organic chemistry. This means that it is very difficult to degrade. There's no process in the natural world that is going to degrade PFAS, which means it'll just be in the environment forever. This also means that it's gonna bioaccumulate in people and animals and cause issues such as cancer, birth defects, and development, develop, developmental delays. Uh, since they don't degrade and they bioaccumulate, it is very dangerous because even at low concentrations, they can cause these issues, which is why there's so much focus on them at the moment. So the problem that P the problem with PFAS and biosolids. So since PFAS are nearly in everything that we deal with, a large amount of it becomes a part of our industrial and residential wastes. This waste ends up getting treated by wastewater treatment plants. But most of these treatment plants are actually unable to treat the influent for PFAS since it's such a new like emerging contaminant. And since PFAS isn't being treated, it ends up in the effluent of these wastewater treatment plants, that being the biosolids. And when these biosolids are then land applied or composted for agricultural use, it, it, can, cause com it can cause potential issues for contamination. The PFAS can then leach from biosolids into groundwater down below, which might be used as a drinking water source. As well, it could be transpired by crops that we or animals may eat. And following along the food chain, eventually these compounds just end up in us accumulating and then causing more health concerns. So the reason this project is so important is because since PFAS has become such a big issue, there's a lot of work going on in the area. It is important to help advance our understanding of how is it that, that PFAS is moving around in biosolids into underwater, underground water and, and other issues. You may have heard of, for example, Maine banning the land application of biosolids for agricultural land, which because of the issue of PFAS in them. So it's very important to understand what things can be done to understand, to change how it may be it's flowing out of biosolids, how it's leaching into groundwater and other places in order to be able to still continue getting all the beneficial uses of biosolids in land application. So this project um, started off with just trying to understand what is the current state of research of PFAS in biosolids. There's a lot of research in, into how PFAS moves through, for example, soil because of the use of aqueous firefighting foams um, in airports um, and military bases. However, there's not quite as much research into how it's moving out of biosolids, which have similar but very different characteristics to soil itself. So we wanted to understand what research has been done and what is currently being understood and identify which of the parameters that are influencing the leaching of PFAS from biosolids. 
and starting off with questions like how does pH affect it? How do different things like organic con um, content or carbon affect the leaching? And all of this, you know, the hopes of designing also an experiment that then Dr. Capiro's lab could use to run experiments to understand how do changing these parameters affect the leaching of PFAS and help us get a better understanding of how it's moving through the environment. So we found many parameters that affect the leaching of PFAS from biosolids listed up there. Um, as you can see, um, there's a lot of them and they all, all influence in multiple different processes such as hydrophobic absorption, air water interface partitioning and, electro ele and electrostatic absorption. These are all many different mechanisms that um, can impact to varying degrees the retention of PFAS in biosolids. So an increased retention would mean that it'll take longer for PFAS to leach out of the biosolids or it might leach over a longer period of time. Understanding this allows us to understand better how it is going out, because even if you have states like Maine that are banning the land application, you already have historic land application, which means there's already PFAS in the ground that may end up leaching from that ground into groundwater currently and in the future. So we're able to identify various parameters and then we also identified how to measure in order to be able to, this, to use this experiment to understand or look at which measurements or which parameters we want to be able to change within our experiment in order to be able to study this. So currently, the New York State Department of Environmental Concentration is actually working with SUNY ESF to collect and test all of the biosolids that are being produced in New York State for PFAS so that we can better actually understand whether applying biosolids in New York State might lead to the contamination and health problems for us. But working with them, we scheduled times that we could go and collect biosolids at the same time that they were. And so here in the pictures, you can see me at Sydney collecting the biosolids. And so the biosolid samples were collected from three different locations, adding on to two locations that Dr. Capiro's group had already actually gathered from. And so the samples were collected from Sydney, Deposit, Hancock, and then Albion and Bergen. And now having these biosolid samples, we looked into actually characterizing the parameters of these samples. And so with the help of Capiro Lab, we performed a DNA extraction on all the biosolids, which is seen in the third picture. And so that for each sample, we isolated like the microbial DNA which could then be sequenced to identify the microbial communities present in the samples. As microbial weathering is a process that could impact the leaching of PFAS, it's an important, it's an important aspect to, to consider how, uh, how fate transport and like the biotransformation of PFAS might actually occur in biosolids. But for a, a better understanding of more factors that might influence the fate and transport of biosolids, more research is actually necessary to be done. And so for more research to be completed on the topic of PFAS leaching, experience, experiments need to be conducted. And so during our literature review, we found examples of experiments, which is seen in the right picture, um, of, of PFAS leaching through biosolids and into soil or down, or, yeah, down into soil. And using those as reference, we created our own experimental setup based off of Dr. Capiro's proposal for the project. We also received feedback from Sally and Molly, who we want to thank from the DEC, who are also currently working with the DEC and SUNY ESF on this project. So here's basically an overview of what we came up with. We're going to be using like a small HDP key, HDPE container, which is, is going to be stacked with like a mixture of gravel, wire mesh, soil, and then bi the biosolids and then a filter paper. Water is then getting precipitated onto the biosolids to simulate rainfall to then begin the leaching process of, P of PFAS from biosolids. So water that seeps through will then accumulate at the bottom and then be collected and tested for PFAS. And all of these materials chosen are, all of the materials chosen are chosen to ensure that there is no PFAS contamination. The soil is USGS characterized and is being gathered from, from the Cornell Soil Department ensuring that there's no P it's PFAS free and that its parameters are already defined. The biosolids that are being used are the ones that we collected from the DEC. And we already have all of those parameters given to us by, by the sampling that they've done, as well as the PFAS information we don't have about that, but SUNY ESF will, will eventually give us that information and report for everything in New York State at some point at the end of this year or beginning of next year. But for the actual container, it's made out of HDPE, HDPE, which is a material that ensures that it won't have interaction with PFAS. Same with the wire mesh. The wire mesh will be made out of stainless steel and choosing, choosing these um, materials ensures that there's little interaction with the PFAS. And continuing like with the experiment, there would need to be like duplicates and triplicates of the, of the bottles to ensure that the results found are actually significant. 
as well. It's found that at the beginning of the, if it's found at the beginning of the experiment, that the biosolids don't have a large amount of PFAS in them, then it's likely that we would spike them with PFAS so that we can actually better understand how the biosolid, how the PFAS are leaching from the biosolids into, into the ground or into the water. So the next steps are pretty much just actually doing the experiments with experimental setup to study different biosolids. There's already five different biosolid samples. So use those and potentially more in the future to see how the PFAS concentration is changing from the influent and how much is leaching out. Um, these experiments are gonna take some time. So they're gonna be conducted by the Kapir lab and going forward. Uh, part of it will also be getting the PFAS biosolid concentration from SUNY ESF. They're still in the process of characterizing the biosolids and getting information. So once we have that information, not only can we use that to run the experiment, but we can also use that to understand better what is the current state of PFAS in biosolids or PFAS in biosolids and also just biosolids in general in New York State, understanding do they have high nitrogen or phosphorus or other um, con uh, components and understanding better in the future how do these different mechanisms or uh, components affect the mechanisms that um, affect uh, leaching, we can better understand if there's any steps that need to be taken in order to prevent more contamination in the environment. This can then inform guidelines into how biosolids application can go forward in the future. So say maybe the things can be changed about the biosolids in order for them to be allowed to be land applied in order to be able to minimize the amount of leaching of uh, PFAS from these biosolids. So thank you so much and we're happy to answer any questions. Um, in the experimental design setup, uh, I was curious what the rationale for the filter paper was. Um, so the filter paper goes on top of the biosolid soil mixture in order to um, create a more even spread of the precipitation. So specifically, since we're talking about such a small area, you know, typically you have a field that's acres big. We're talking about something's going to be about... I don't know if the diameter of the bottle. It's like a five inch diameter. Yeah, bottle. so it's very small. So we have this simulated precipitation using syringe needles, I believe. Um, however, we don't want it landing consistently on the same spots because this is representative of how rain is falling in the real world. You're gonna have water that's falling over a general area. Um, and the goal here is not so much, you know, it's the goal is to have the water be flowing through it in a realistic manner. Um, so the filter paper creates an even distribution of the water over the biosolids um, to have a equal spread um, of flowing through the water instead of like channeling or anything like that. Uh, Russell? The idea that, um, you know, biosolids will be characterized by PFAS before and after uh, this experiment, as well as in the soil, as well as, is there a, is there a plan to also like, not sure if there's any PFAS in the rainwater, like how, what is basically like our start in an attempt? Because there are, yeah, you're starting with no PFAS in the soil, but are you thinking some of it may leach into the soil and not make it actually all the way out to the water by at the end of the lab? Um, so do you know if, if there are plans to like measure PFAS across all those? Yeah. Um starting like with the rainwater, the rainwater wouldn't have any PFAS in it. We would want to make sure that that's clear of that. But then, yeah, biosolids would definitely be tested before for PFAS. There's no PFAS, then we add PFAS. The soil, no PFAS at the beginning. We weren't really thinking about testing it at the end because mostly what we're wanting to like focus on is the PFAS that's coming out, out at the end as that's PFAS that would like possibly end up in our groundwater. And if it's not, if it's not leaving the biosolids or it's not leaving the soil, then it's possible that that, that might not lead to like a contamination. So that might not be like a potential issue. Yeah, the goal was to simulate realistic conditions of in a field where you're applying um, biosolids. So it's gonna be the top 15 centimeters or not necessarily 15 centimeters depending on the size of the bottle, but try to simulate realistic conditions of biosolids being applied to agricultural land and seeing how much is leaching out. So we are going into the consideration of the PFAS is probably going to sorb to the soil to some extent. Um, and that's something that's gonna be taken into account when um, examining the leachate as well. With the experiment, you have the capacity to change the amount of soil that's gonna be present. So you could do uh, bigger or smaller columns um, in order to account for that. Do you know, I'm wondering if PFAS react with acidic um, rain? 
Like, and if if it's if it does, will you be taking that into consideration if you go to a place that have, might have more acidic rain than others when it is a soil improvement? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, the noise that Petri is very persistent, um, so it's very difficult to break down. Um, I don't know that to what extent um, acidic rain could impact it, but it's probably not going to change the composition itself. However, if, for example, pH is a significant factor in how it's sorbing, having acidic rain might make it so that it stays in the soil for longer and doesn't leach quite as much or maybe leach faster. So that's something that can be examined or inferred through the analysis of the impact that pH changes, for example, have on it. Thank you. Anything else? Brian? I was just thinking one way to potentially answer these questions that have the answer is this. I think you're maybe you're trying to do a mass balance on the, the PFAS. Uh, so if you do add PFAS and I think I think you would want to have some sort of way of saying like, okay, if it didn't come out in the water, yeah. where did it go? Yeah. Um, is it still in the biosolids? Did it soar to the soil? Is it stuck to the gravel? Right? I don't know. Um, if, if it all comes out, then great, you've got it. Uh, but if it doesn't, you you have a good contain you have a you have a contained system that gives you like a unique opportunity to figure out what it what it is doing. Um, yeah. If it's not actually you know transporting out of the system. Yeah. Sorry for going a little bit over time, but just to answer that and also kind of answer Russell's previous question is. The goal here is then, yes, it might be sorbing to the soil to some extent, but the idea is we'll be having different biosolids all being tested with the same soil. So the amount of that it's sorbing to the soil is going to be the same, but it's going to be different depending on the biosolid itself. How long? And so we change the biosolid, but we leave the same soil, the same gravel. So even if it's in, in, interacting the same way with the soil, it'll be equal throughout all of them, but we'll still see differences in the leachate from the collection valve based on which bath solid we're using. And so we'll have information of how are the bath solids different. So it is kind of that idea. Um, and in the future, then we can still look into the possibility of testing the soil for the um, PFAS if we think that that's a significant source of sorbing. But that's also, we're not specifically trying to study how it's sorbing to soil, it's more so how it's sor sorbing and desorbing from bath solids. Sure, I, I would just add that as soon as you put biosolids and water together with the soil in close proximity, you have different soil. So, like, you just may want you may not you may not want to be too sure that like the soil is the soil no matter which tube you're looking at. If your biosolids are different, just because you know it's like a universe of reactions and stuff going on there. So, if, if the biosolids are different in different tubes, um, you know, I, I would say you you may want to. It might be a hypothesis that the soil is the same. But I don't know that that's been proven yet. And if you think about it, like, you know, you're using different biosolids, they have different, if, if they have PFAS, or if you're testing different PFAS, the chain length, all that is going to be impacted, um, like it's going to behave differently once that water passes through. It could be retained by the soil, but then if enough water goes through it, then maybe then it leaches out. So sometimes, uh, you know, the soil could be like that, like, you know, acts like a filter and it stay, keeps it there. Uh, it's still, <coughs> if you're anyway measuring biosolids, I would say anyway measure the soil uh, because they're probably the same way to, to combust the sample and, you know, I'm sorry, to pass the sample and make it ready for LCMS. So might as well do that to try to close that mass balance that Brian is talking about. If, yeah. yeah. The soil can be definitely looked at. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for listening to us um, and to everybody. Um, here are all of our emails. If anybody has any further questions they want to ask about a product center, all of us would be happy to answer them through email. Um, we have some more time. If there's any other lingering questions about any of the presentations, feel free to ask them now. And, you know, I guess we're going to invite the other interns to also join us up here for that. Um, I don't know if any questions that popped up after any of the presentations. Is there anything online? Is there anything online? Nope. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dr. Kapir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so if there's nothing else, I don't know if Kristen, you want to say some final remarks or somebody else? <laughs> no, I, yeah, just thank you. That was a little thing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> nice, really nice job, everyone. And um uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming online. And again, just to follow up with um, all of the interns for about specific products, 
if, if you want to see their reports, uh, you know, there's more under the hood than they were able to present today in these 10 minute talks. So um, yeah, please follow up with their products, follow up with the reports and big thanks again to uh, everybody who was involved in this program, particularly the interns who did a great job. Yeah, thank you so much.